Hello, everyone. Hello. I just had a little technical difficulty right there. <laughs> Thank you all so much uh, for joining us this evening. Uh, we appreciate you being patient with us. You know, these things these things happen sometimes. Um, but we are we are so happy that you're here with us. Uh, my name is Joey Reyes. My pronouns are they them theirs, and I'm the line producer at Long Wharf Theater. And before we begin, I'd like to take a moment to recognize that Long Wharf Theater sits on the unceded territory of the Pogosit, Quinnipiac, and Wapinger peoples. As we begin today, we acknowledge that Indigenous peoples and nations have for generations stewarded the lands and waterways of what we now call the state of Connecticut. We honor and respect the enduring relationship that exists between these peoples and nations and this land. We remind ourselves that along with stolen land came stolen people. It is our responsibility to the future to know our past. If this is your first time joining us, welcome. The Lab is a free public event that takes place virtually for now, uh, once a month, and is made possible by the support of the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. And tonight's event in particular is presented in partnership with Joe's Pub uh, at the Public Theater in New York City. These events are curated by local and national artists who are in residency at Long Wharf Theater, either in person or virtually. And the subjects that are explored in the Lab are as dynamic as the artists that host them. This month, uh, the lab is curated by Haig Papazian. Uh, Haig is a multidisciplinary artist, storyteller, musician, architect, painter, and composer based in New York City, where he develops works that explore the multifaceted meanings of home. He's known as the founding member and violinist of Mashru Laila, the Lebanese band whose electropop anthems about political freedom, race, gender, and modern Arabic identity have challenged the status quo of the Middle Eastern music industry. Haig is currently musician in residence at Shim NYC by AFI, Thomas Dot, and Joe's Pub NY Voices Pro New York Voices Program, and has completed residencies at Greenwich House and Brooklyn College Center for the Performing Arts. Please use the chat to welcome Haig and express your enthusiasm throughout the program. Thank you, Joey. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, Super excited to be here doing this presentation at the lab, uh, Longworth Theater here in New Haven, where I've been doing a uh, presence for the last couple of days, working on my project called the Space Time Machine Machine. So it's when somebody asks me like what the project is, what is Space Time Tuning Machine? It's, is it a musical? Is it a, uh concert is it a it's it's difficult to explain so i'm going to try to do that and think out loudly so uh think of this as a uh work as a work in progress of trying to figure out how to explain this project that is everything about uh traveling across time and space uh it's about identity it's about uh music and sounds it's uh about troubadours who can't remember any of the songs they used to sing it's about uh robot birds and ai uh it's also a, it's a story kind of for kids and adults so let me go back to the beginning. Uh, I think it was around the beginning of uh, 2020, maybe February, when right before, I think, uh, the, right before the uh pandemic had started and i was thinking of writing a a, a series of like stories for ch children's books but meant for adults kind of like the little prince i had written like one little short story about the fox and kind of like what happens to the fox and the little prince and somehow like that triggered this idea of uh doing a collection of short stories as a children book with four adults. I was writing some of them and then the pandemic hit and then all the, our concerts kind of like stopped. 
And that project kind of like fell through for now, went to sleep. And then afterwards, uh, I was trying to sort of start doing like some sort of a work, uh, musical work or projects or any sort of exercises. And uh, I remember it was like, like one, it was the beginning of the pandemic when th there was no one in the streets, everybody was in uh, locked in their uh, almost like apartments and houses. And I was, I was, uh, my roommates back then had decided to leave. I was living in Brooklyn. So I was alone uh, for a few days trying to do little projects here and there. And yeah, one day I kind of decided to go to my bedroom window, which is overlooking the park at Fort Greene, and just to play a couple of songs. I thought that maybe if I play like sad music on my violin through the window, it kind of like would resonate with at least like the people who were passing through uh, in the neighborhood. I mean, back then, most of them were essential workers and uh, uh, people who were working at the hospital, uh, which was nearby. So, yeah, I kind of like started playing. And part of the exercise was to remember songs and to play them without kind of like listening to the reference of the song. So it was just kind of like a riff of like memory and uh, kind of like the music that I grew up with. And <laughs> funny enough, I mean, most of them are kind of like sad music. Uh, if you look back at the repertoire of <laughs> Armenian music, there's either very happy music or mostly sad music, I guess, it, because of the, yeah, of the, uh, this is kind of, weird talking to myself right now on the screen but let's do this so so that's one of those songs that i was playing was a song uh, called about a crane about a dislocated wanderer who is uh trying to kind of like a is it, a dislocated wanderer who sees a crane kind of like flying uh, in the sky. And the whole song is a serenade to the crane asking him to for news about the world and uh, all, all sorts of things like related to the homeland. And somehow like that song got stuck with me for a while. And it's it's a song about longing from home but it's also more than that it's it's a song that has been with me ever since i was a kid and it's a song that represents like so many uh of the different moments uh of my life growing up identity is a big part of kind of like uh who i was growing up as an armenian in beirut uh it's a it's already kind of like a situation where you're at a home away from home. So for me, like during the pandemic and kind of like having to deal with a lot of the events that happened in Lebanon to my band in August, 2019, and then me being away, like me being in New York, away from my family, from my home, kind of uh, somehow that song was, became a, uh, an important kind of like a daily routine to just play like out the window. And at some point I recorded it on a, like on just my phone and put it on Instagram and Facebook. Uh, it called like variations of uh, trains migrating elsewhere. And somehow that video, even though I posted it like for friends and family, it just like took a life of its own and it just, kind of like migrated to the different corners of the internet. And uh, I started receiving these WhatsApp messages with the video uh, 
I don't know, with some with different languages, subtitles, and people having different additions to it. That was kind of like a, another phase of uh, the pandemic, yeah, of, of the project. And I remember somehow in towards, I think, May, June, I kind of like started this research on on the like, uh, dreams and Walter Benjamin and uh, it's the whole thing kind of like one thing that to another to another. It's like this CM kind of like a wormhole, loophole, a black hole <laughs> research, Wikipedia moments where you have like these brilliant ideas and then write them down and then you get stuck in research and then time sort of like didn't really uh, work the way that it works usually, especially like for me, like we were touring almost like every other month. Uh, most of the time, you know, like uh, for 10 shows, 20 shows. I mean, last year on this, two years ago around this time was our final, final concert actually in the US. Uh, it was in DC. Uh, at the 9.30 club, and I remember actually it was just, uh, the schedule was hectic and different, and it was just a different pace of life. And now, uh, now having performed for almost two years in front of a live crowd uh, and presenting this new body of work, which is a little bit different because it's also not a, it's, it's not one thing and it's not another thing. It's not an art, performance art, it's not a music, I don't know what it is. It's maybe it's all of it. So let me just kind of like play some videos and things for you. Let's talk about this, the, what it is. So somehow like the projects, the space engineering machine, it's an autobiographical kind of like sci-fi fantasy based on, uh, real historical uh, narratives and yeah it's 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 based on the song about the crane but two versions of the song the well, first version of the song is similar to the one that i kind of like grew up getting to know and the other version is one that i recently rediscovered let me play you the first version of the song so maybe we can hear it. Uh, I'm not sure if this is working. Uh, hmm. I don't think so. Let me try it again. Oh, 
So that was uh, one version of the song that uh, Gomidas Vardabed, who was a priest who studied music in Berlin and around the turn of the 20th century, and then moved back to uh, Armenia, which was under Ottoman Empire back then, uh, and with a project of documenting the folk music of Anatolia. So he had this project where he went to different villages and uh, transcribed a lot of the songs, but part of the project was it's somehow like because he's he was using the uh, I guess uh, Western uh, notation the twelve tone kind of like a notation system uh, to transcribe. Some of the music was kind of like uh, simplified and made the arrangements were made so that it could be sung by a choir, which was when presented, uh, I guess, in Paris in around, around I think, 1912. Uh, uh, it was met with, I don't know, it was around the time that Armenian genocide was in process, the massacres were happening, and then people were kind of like very much uh, affected by it. But around the same time, in 1917, a woman named Zalir Kanosian uh, records the same song in New York at the uh, Woolworth building where Columbia Records, uh, which had a very large uh, non-English uh, music collection. Uh, yeah, uh, she recorded that song at Columbia Records and uh, her version was Closer to actually a version that my mom used to sing, which is uh, more like a, I guess, a, her village is kind of like version, it's out of like memory. So uh, it's, it was just interesting to rediscover discover that version. Uh, and let's. So it's the same song and it's more or less like the same, uh, uh, exactly the same lyrics where, again, it's a dislocated person who is far away from their home and uh, they see a crane and start singing to the crane to 
saying, uh, Dear Crane, like I am but a servant of your voice. Uh, do you have any news from our world? Uh, so it's that kind of a that idea that the song probably had like a multiple versions and had traveled like in a different way throughout the history and then one person decides to uh, document it and then we mainly have the documented version and mu like multiple versions of it like right now if you just go to youtube and uh or any of the streaming services you just you just type in the the song that's what you're going to hear maybe but it's it's interesting to, like, to know that there were a lot of different versions that have uh, been there and this idea of uh, the crane being this migrating uh, bird uh, that represents home has been uh, present like in throughout like history uh, and it can go back all the way to maybe like the ninth century conference of the birds and even like earlier it's these birds that are kind of like uh going from one place to another and it's it's yeah it's it's just all of these things were kind of like little projects that i was doing here and there a bit of research and at some point i came across this uh this drawing uh when i was reading uh book on soundscapes and this is a tuning of the world uh, by uh i have to remember <laughs> the name it's like one of those things where uh, he Yes. Can't remember the name right now. It's one of those COVID, I guess, so uh, side effects that people have been forgetting things. Let's blame everything on COVID. All right. Uh, so what's interesting about this is that there's a hand that's tuning an instrument and it's tuning it's, it's as if there's a uh, two worlds that are like uh, kind of like one on top of the other and then a third kind of like circle that encompasses it's kind of like the uh what i don't know what uh, you would say as the uh kind of like the harmonies of like the heaven and earth it's like uh the there's uh it's kind of like the tuning the tuning, musical tuning, in relationship to kind of like mathematics and ratios and fractions. Uh, and it's kind of like sort of like from the like uh, Pythagore, Pythagore, I don't know how you say it like in English, uh, like the Greeks and Arabs, like it, they all kind of like had these uh, crazy theories about like music, but like this one and in, in this instruments like uh, there's something fascinating to me that uh started to occur which is how the for me like those two songs kind of like were the same songs but the tuning uh the notation tuning notation system of like were a little different and that kind of like changed the whole aspect of uh, of how you would uh, how you'd hear it and how it's kind of like received and how it survived. Yeah, there's so much I want to show you, but I, it's it's kind of like the it's a little bit like all over the place. Let me let me move forward a little bit. So we have a children's short story. We have the two songs. We have kind of uh, this idea of. Uh, tuning systems uh i remember actually when i was younger uh i was attracted to the violin because of it being this fretless instrument instrument and 
even though like sometimes it can easily go out of tune when you're playing a, a show it's uh it's it's always it, there is something like magical about the fact that wherever you put your finger you slide on it it'll just play like any any kind of like sound any music any 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 sound that you want but this idea of like being in tune and out of tune has always kind of like been with me uh from when i was playing classical music uh young as a, at a young age or even when i was kind of like with, uh playing music like with my band and somehow i wanted to explore this idea as well this uh what makes a song like uh what it is like it's it's how how to how to approach like music how to approach kind of like this idea of like if you have no uh understanding of music at all and you have an instrument in front of you and you want to play it right now with the piano and with all most of the western musical instruments the notes are already defined for you even when, when it comes to electronic uh analog or digital kind of uh the synthesizers or instruments uh it's also more or less your, as long as you're using a MIDI control that's a keyboard, you're kind of like bounced to those uh, those sounds. Uh, it's what can be this instrument or this machine that's might just, I don't know, uh, do things like a little differently. That was kind of like something that was just like in the back of my head as well. Again, like I'm just giving you right now like a backstory of how I'm thinking about the music, what uh, what are the things that are maybe at the core of, of this project. Uh, yeah, so after all of this and when I started like the different residencies, like with uh, uh, AFI and Tamizat and Joe's Pub, I kind of like sort of started working on this idea of building a machine, a musical instrument that uh, is a combination of a lot of different musical instruments. Back then, like I only had my violin, so I started kind of uh, playing with toys, with synthesizers, with uh, a lot of like old electronics, trying to hack them to see what kind of sounds they would make. And yeah, try to figure out uh, ways to uh, maybe make an instrument that uh, isn't biased, like the way a piano is, and try to kind of like create something that can, Let's put it this way, an instrument where, where when it's on or when you, when at, it's, it starts off with a thick layer of sound and then to play it, you have to remove the sound and reduce it to uh, one that you choose. And then after that, it's a whole other kind of, uh, I don't know, like that, that was the idea in the beginning. So I wanted to build this thing. I didn't know like how to uh, move forward. So it was just a combination of like trying to figure out like a narrative uh, for the, for this project. It's, it's at, at some point I remember like kind of like, uh, wrote down a lot of the ideas that I had, like for this book, uh, children's book that I wanted to do. And that, that kind of like translated to the ideas for uh, the two songs that I just mentioned about and the idea of the, this musical instrument, the tuning instrument. And then I came up with this uh, character of a troubadour who wakes up uh with no recollection of like the music that he used to sing and next to him was a broken instrument and a bird 
And the tradition of like Armenian Arabic kind of like storytelling, every story starts with there was and there wasn't. It happened and didn't happen. Garuchigar, Kanyamakan. It's as if uh, everything that's going to be told is hanging in a perfect balance between uh, reality and uh, fiction. Uh, existence and non existence. It's just in the spectrum in between, and it's up to the person who's listening to the story to kind of like decide what's real and what's not. So, with this tradition, it's uh, I kind of like situated this idea that together with the troubadour uh, discovers that the bird is not a bird as well because the bird is that he wakes up next to is talking and it's a uh yeah it's it's a machine that's uh malfunctioned from its original programming and uh somehow has gained its own kind of like consciousness and this these two characters build a space time tuning machine and to try to go back to the only memory of a uh, home that the troubadour has, which is that of uh, that a moment that where he remembers, like from his childhood, somewhere like uh, hearing like a, a sound of a woman singing that song about the crane. But instead of like going back in time, they travel from one world to another. And these are parallel worlds, parallel universes, where in every world, everything is almost the same, but not. It's, uh, it's a place like here, but not here. A time like the present, but not the present. And with that kind of like mindset, in every world, home means something else. That was like the key of what most of the project was alluding to. It's kind of like everything that was somehow like about home and trying to find home, uh, losing home and uh, making new meanings for what home can be. Uh, I mean, I can give you like one last like week. I'm trying to build like this time machine for my ahead of my performance for at uh, Joe's Pub, where it's gonna be something a little crazy, uh, a little I've, I don't know. It's it's not something that I've done before, so fingers crossed for that. Uh, yeah, it's there's. A lot more that I can talk about. I mean, my cat has been an inspiration for building this kind of like time machine. Let me let me see if this is gonna play. And. <laughs> I guess like if you're looking at this right now, you're like, what is this? This is a... Uh... Well, let's say this is like part of the project. Hopefully... Uh, multiple layers of like of bow being transposed like on top of each other. It's like as if these different realities that exist exist together. Uh, yeah, and and at Brooklyn College, I was kind of like working on different ways of like presenting these. Uh, 
the, the time machine and like one of the things that I ended up coming up with was this over here. Which is a, it's this machine that's kind of like a, the musical instruments that can be performed by a lot of like different people. And uh, it, the, way, the way that I was thinking about it was maybe like an installation piece where it's a combination of found in, like all the existing instruments and the instruments that I'm creating combined together, creating a volume where there's parts of it can be projected and the sound can will start off as like this very thick layer and it just uh, kind of like a, becomes into turns into yeah it's uh, that one layer that's gonna be the layer that makes us think of home and Uh, when I think about that, I also think about this. So that's like a little preview of maybe what's gonna, <laughs> what we're gonna see it. Uh, the upcoming performances of Joe's Pub, it's 2345 November. And uh, there's, let me, like, let me kind of like show you some of the little sound gadget he thinks that I've been. This over here is an instrument that detects like uh, sound waves, and it's mostly like noise, but. It's, fu it's funny because like when, when we think of like noise, it's not a, uh, it's something that we don't necessarily, uh, it's, it's not something we associate with music, but I just wanted like this instrument to be this noise machine and the sound machine where parts of it are strings, parts of it are these kind of like elements that uh, kind of like a theremin where you get closer to it and it makes, different types of like uh, noises or sounds and and depending on the sensitivity this is this is where we, we go into the like a uh, sci-fi cuckoo land uh, which is kind of funny and fun I've been, like throughout the project, I've been reading like a lot of like sci-fi kind of uh, uh, stories, watching a lot of like sci-fi film. It's been like Einstein's dreams has been a big inspiration for that. Uh, and even I've, with at the at with like with Joe's Pub and the public theater uh, at the public theater, I've been also uh, working with the dramaturg Jesse. Cameron Alec, and he's Jesse Alec. He's been a very kind of like a helpful, helpful kind of like person to make the narrative richer uh, when it comes to uh, thinking about like these different worlds and how kind of like the song, you know, where there are multiple versions of it and uh, multiple tunings. Uh, the worlds uh, have like multiple. Uh, uh, understandings of homes uh, 
I'm sure like in probably in a parallel world, like I'm doing this presentation right now and it's going like a lot smoother <laughs> than this one. But uh, fingers, did I do something wrong here? Wait a second. No, it's still on. We're still on. Uh, yeah. And I don't know at this point if, uh, let me try something else here. Uh, let me take away from this. Like so, part of the project is also to kind of like have a lot of these little uh, microphones that start to detect uh, sounds that don't necessarily need to make sound. I don't know. It's it's a uh, it's a lot of like little experiments. Uh, I. I wasn't able like, to get like, all the instruments that I've made uh, uh, from uh, New York to here to New Haven, but uh, trying to show as much as I can right now from the stuff, because right now I'm also wanting to show you here, somewhere over in the back, the base structure of the time machine is kind of like happening so if you want to see the whole thing my part of will be there for those stuff one final piece is this should be interesting. So I don't know if we can do it Maybe here. Um, connect. Uh, 
Boom. Yeah. Part of the idea was even like to have... Oh, did you hear that? Part of the idea was to have music played through books. Uh, and I did a little performance like a couple of months ago at at uh, it was Greenwich House Music School, and so this is a book, <laughs> is a copy book. <laughs> but what happens is when I touch it. It's boom, and it's not making a sound. And if I maybe change it into a different Only playing this sound, I need to do a different synth synthesizer. Let me find it anyway. So, from that, something like this. I guess maybe at this point do we there is some shit about it that I forgot to talk about, especially looking at my notes. But maybe we can see these, we can talk about these during this discussion with uh oh wow, I'm just reading all of these uh comments on the public. I don't know if, uh, what time it is. If, was Kate, uh, can join now, later? Hi. Oh. Thank you so much. Thank you so okay. much, Hag. Thank you for, uh, it, it was it was so exciting to hear. I mean, I, I've gotten to hear throughout the week, but so exciting to hear in more depth about the evolution of the piece, the the creation of the piece and, and sort of the, um, the, the, the threads you're continuing to weave of it. Um, I think it's, it's very exciting and I'm interested to see where it continues to go as you develop it. Um, I had a just a couple of questions. I think you know you you spoke in such depth um, that I feel like my questions will just sort of glaze the surface. But um, had a couple of questions, and then if anybody from the group uh, watching has any questions in the chat, we can you know address those as well. Um, but I know so of course we're on Zoom, so folks are are being able to see it and and hear about the piece. I know that eventually you're interested in there being kind of an interactive component to the machine. Um, I was wondering if you'd like to talk a little bit more about that, as you just did with the book. Yeah. So. So this is so the way that I was thinking of like this machine. It's, and, kind of like an interactive like instrument where, uh, I'm hoping that. Uh, part of it can be like throughout the performance and part of like on its own where different artists, where I would invite different artists to play on this instrument with me and to kind of like both of us like to, uh, I guess like the same way music improv happens where uh, you would uh, choose like part of the machine that kind of uh, 
is closest to what you know how to play. I don't know, it, it, and what a person knows how to play, and uh, just like yeah, start creating like music together, like in that sense. And if it's on a, uh, it's it's kind of like this. Every, every person, the the way that they approach something, when they when asked like to think about like music that uh, reminds them of home, would be very interesting like to see like how they would interact on this machine, and how they would be able to, what kind of like tuning they would like use to, uh, to 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 play it. Yeah, even like if it's just the machine itself like in a room and someone would come and interact with it and then start playing with it and making sounds the machine is supposed to kind of like record all of that for future kind of like reference you know that becomes like part of the sound it's like as if like whatever is being played on it is stored to in this thick layer of foggy sound that's let's say let's say that right and yeah it's i don't know it's like kind of like something that a sound that's like continuously growing and then from that complete like noise uh you're supposed to find hopefully i'm hoping that like uh, people will be able to uh forget like whatever they think of what music is and then just uh maybe think of it as kind of like the way memories or like the mind works you know where you're there's too many information and then they kind of like choose one uh reduce it to just one and don't know if it makes sense yeah definitely i think that that idea really resonated with me when you spoke about um sort of there there being this this thick wall of sound and then rather than thinking of tuning as going from silence to sound it being more about pulling sound out of that that wall of sound and sort of fine tuning it. I also I, I love what you said earlier about um, uh, this piece being about multiple tunings and understand different understandings of worlds and understandings of home. Um, and so that that idea of it being interactive and and working with other folks um, on the piece who might have different different tunings or understandings, I think is really, um, it is, is a really rich and exciting one. Um, the, the only other question I have before we open it up to the group, um, in addition to being a, a musician, you, you are trained a trained architect. Um, and I'm curious to hear more about how that work has influenced your work on this piece, specifically the creation of the machine. Yeah, it's here's the thing. Well, studying architecture was kind of like opened up uh, my mind to a lot of things, like in how the world kind of like the, the way that I see that the world functions. You know, it's it's just a. Uh, I've always been very much intrigued by. Uh, a lot of different creative and artistic disciplines and somehow like looking at most of this all of this like through the lens of architecture and like through the spatial lens uh gives it like this new dim dimension it's like looking at let's say a musical composition not from the angle of a musician or a composer or an audience but like let's say from a completely different angle where the sounds are not necessarily uh, about the uh, rhythmic pattern or whatever, but it's kind of like a, a structural kind of like element that becomes part of another story that it can merge with. It's it's these kind of like links or connections, uh, like layered connections between a song and a historical document and a film and a, I don't know, a, a painting and a building, all of these things can start to make sense. And I feel I'm not, again, like it makes sense like for me in the project, it's probably like at some point, uh, which is what I started to do for the presentation, I should probably make like one of those huge kind of like maps of uh, 
of this project and of where every single element of it is and how it's connected to the rest of it and what are the links that kind of like between all of them to weave together like this uh, this narrative and the different phases of the project. That's actually something that I forgot to talk about, which is the way that I was thinking of the project is in phases. Uh, and I guess like here, I'm going to borrow some vocabulary from the architectural world where you have the uh, preliminary kind of like research phase, you have the concept phase, uh, which can one can come before the other. So uh, it doesn't uh, necessarily need to start with research, doesn't need to start with uh, uh, with concept. It can start with both uh, as well at the same time, like in parallel. And afterwards, you have the preliminary design, you have the design development, and you have like the different types of documents that you need to produce where one is for a client, one is for the construction documents that is for the engineer, you have uh, permit documents for the municipality, you have all of these different documents of the same project, but they're using different language to translate ideas that are uh, inherent to the project. And then you see the project getting built in the next phase and then after the project is built it changes once people move in and live it becomes like lived in or used or so in that sense like i'm i was thinking of this project in many different phases where phase one was a lot of the research and historical kind of like a research on the project uh and the cooking of the ideas that's another like term from <laughs> discipline that I don't know much of cooking. Uh, uh, yeah, it's a, how can I describe it? Yeah, phase one, for example, was, uh, and then another phase of the project was uh, thinking of the musical aspects of it. Another phase was uh, building the machine itself. And here to come back to your question, which is, uh, how do we like how to create like how do how do we build this instrument what are the design elements of it and <laughs> inspiration like coming from whether it's like from the from my cat and this kind of like a running exercise uh wheel patterns or uh if it's like something from i don't know a sci-fi film or it's it's endless and Another phase of it was to create this narrative, the story, the, the children's story for adults, and then use that narrative to transpose it on the instrument and the music, and then kind of like create like a musical narrative through that. And then a visual narrative becomes the next phase, which is like, how do you create like a, this feeling of home through uh, visuals, through the music, through the, I don't know, light and shadow, like all of these kind of like different elements. Yeah, it's, it's probably at this point, everybody is kind of like oversaturated with all the tangents and perils that like we went to, but I guess, it's at least like a glimpse like of how things are like in my brain. Yeah, thank you so much. I think it's 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 so exciting to get a glimpse into. I think it's such a it's a, um, a rich and expansive vision. And so I think it's it's so exciting even to get a, um, a glimpse of it. And if folks want to continue to see more, they can come to the um, Habibi Festival at Joe's Pub um, and see see the next next phase of it. Um, but I think for now, we will turn it back over to Joey um, to close us out um, with a lot of gratitude to Haig uh, for this residency and, and this week. Thank you for having me. And it's, it's, been, it's been really great like, to, to be here in New Haven and uh, Long War Theater to be part of the lab, get to have these conversations with all of you. Thank you. Grateful that you could be here. 
Yes, thank you so much, Haig. We really appreciate you thank taking you your time to be with us and, and to present your what you're working on with everyone. Uh, and thank you so much to everyone who's joined us this evening. Um, again, tonight's uh, presentation was presented in partnership with Joe's Pub. Make sure that you go and check out the Habibi Festival uh, if you're in town. And thank you once again to the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation for their continued support of the lab. Uh, thank you all so much. Have a wonderful evening, and we will see you, you. next month.